Well, g'day, Max here again. Welcome back to the shop. So today we are going to cut our pinion gear for the JFMT lathe's apron. So that's the, we already pre-machined the shaft in an earlier video, so now we have to cut the teeth. Now, I have explained in a previous video, the last comments about it would have been on the, at the beginning of the video where I made the guard for the tool and cutter grinder a few weeks back and I went through some of the reasons why we could not cut this gear in one pass with a standard gear tooth cutter. So let me just swing you down. We'll just do a quick brief recap on that as it's going to be quite a complex operation to cut this gear. It means the shaft will have to come in and out of the chuck several times and we'll be cutting the gear with three different cutters. So let's swing you down and we'll go through my reasoning for doing that. Now we're not going to have a practice go on a bit of plastic, aluminium or some other piece of crap. We're going to go straight into it. The reason we're <coughs> uh, not doing a practice run is because all of all of the offset changes. Now, it's quite easy to make an error and an offset change because a lot of them are done manually by hand by just shifting the part. So I fail to see the reason for doing a practice part. Um, in the unlikely event that we make a pig's ass of it, well, yeah, we just have to make a new shaft and start again, but uh, I'm, I don't really foresee that happening. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Come down. So basically, in a nutshell, to recap on why we cannot cut this with uh, one single cutter in, in one, one go, is this is a custom pinion. It's not a standard 2.5 module pitch pinion, meaning the pitch circle diameter is larger than a standard pinion. Therefore, the OD is larger and that makes the tooth pro uh, profile change. The reason for that is on such a small pinion, at the base of the tooth, there should, if this was a standard pinion, there should be an undercut on the base of the pinion, right down the bottom of the um, dedendum there. And that's just to provide clearance for the mating gear tooth. Now, I think the reasons that, uh, uh, that they do that is for, it's a production reason, and it's a cheaper way to make the pinion, so by not having to do that undercut. So what, what we're going to do, we're going to bulk the lion's share of the material out. Now the ideal cutter that I have is this 45 degree cutter and that fits in there quite nice and would, would bulk that out very well if it was running offset. But I don't feel this cutter's quite got enough edge on it and I do not have my indexer set up properly yet on the tool and cutter grinder to sharpen this cutter before we use it. So, what I'm going to do, I think, I'm going to take out as much as I, well, the top part out, as much as I can with a slitting saw. Then we can go in with our number two module cutter and cut the dedendum. And then we can finish off with uh, two offsets on a uh, 2.5 module cutter to cut the addendum, which is the top half of the tooth. So that's the way we have to do it. Now the module 2 cutter, the tooth is actually deeper than what this cutter will cut. So that's why we are offsetting as well with the module 2.5 and the rack that the, it this mates to is a module 2.5. So that's why we're 
doing the long-winded method and it will also mean that we will have to set up the old shaft in the indexing head to set our cutter positioning, take the old one out, put the new one in and make the cut. Um, I do not really see any other way around it with the cutters that I have and yeah, that's going to be, I think, the easiest, most uh, fail-safe method to tackle this job. So the other reason for trying to bulk a lot of it out too with a slitting saw is the material on the new shaft is, this is a very tough material, this. So it's not going to be that friendly on these cutters. So I just want to virtually be doing a finishing cut with these two cutters. I don't want them bulking out material. Um, as a slitting saw is cheaper to resharpen. Um, yeah, it's just better to bulk. I feel it's just better to bulk it out first and then just use these cutters for a finishing cut. It keeps, it keeps these cutters in good nick. So we want to index 12 divisions because we have 12 teeth to cut. So our indexing formula, 40 over N being 40 over the number of teeth, which gives us 40 over 12. So we divide 12 into 40. That'll go three times as a whole number, which gives us um, 36. Well, so it gives us three. So 12 divided into 40 gives us three. There's our three whole turns on the crank. So three twelves of 36 is four left over. So three and four twelfths. That's our index, what we have to index. Now, that would mean three turns and four holes on a 12 hole plate. But we don't have a 12 hole plate. Our plates go from 24, 28, 30, 34, 37, blah, 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 up to 100 on, on my indexing head. So we can break this fraction down and that can be taken down to 2 6 or 1 third. So we need 3 and 1 third turns. If we look along here, there's a plate here, 39. That can be easily broken down into 1 third. So what would that be? 13. So we're going to go 3 turns. 13 holes on a 39 hole plate. Now, if your, your normal run of the mill indexing head has a different series of plates than mine. So, when in doubt, we can cheat. So if we look up in the chart for 12 holes, this gives us two, uh, two options. So we can, to divide 12 divisions, we can use three turns and nine holes on a 27 hole plate, or we can use three turns and 13 holes on a 39 hole plate, which is what we're going to use here. So let's find out 39 hole ring of holes. So which is this one here. And, well, we're actually on 39. Um, now, if I was to adjust that, I would just slacken off this nut and this little arm cranks around and that will allow the uh, little pointer to engage from like up here to down there. So that's good, we're already on 39 holes. Now what was it, 13 holes on a 39 hole plate. So our 13 holes will be measured by these arms. These are called sector arms. Your pointer, when you count your holes, should be in between the two tapered faces. Not, not like that, the two non-tapered faces. That is the wrong way. So it's always 
between the two tapered faces. That gives you, makes it easier to see when you're coming up to your hole. So, what we'll do is we'll put this on 39. This one will come up solid against this one, so we count 13 holes. So, uh, I'm going to actually mark this with a, a pencil so I don't lose. Well, when I say I don't lose, I don't end up in the row of holes next to it. So we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13 right there, which is you went off camera. I'll move you back Yeah, 13's down here, so we'll nip up our sector arms We always double check one two three four Five six seven eight nine Oops ten 11, 12, 13. Okay. So, after when we go to indexing, what we'd do is we'd crank this around to here, take a chuck key out of the chuck, three full turns, and then we come around to there, then we move the plate. Three full turns, back round. Three full turns, back around. Now, if you accidentally just go a little bit past, you've got to come back, take out the backlash, and then come back around again. Okay. So... Just ignore this inner um, set of um, indexing positions as well. I did do a video covering this uh, a long time ago, and it's very rare that I actually need to use it. This will index all of the in, uh, all of the divisions that your standard indexing plate can't do. So it's actually called a wide range indexer, and it can do 400,000 divisions. So the big advantage of this style of dividing head is you're not dicking around um, doing gear calculations for differential indexing, um, whereas this can just do it straight out of the box with its standard plate. Right, oh, we're um, we're done with all the technicalities. So let's get our our shaft set up. We're going to set up the old one first, so we can do the roughing cuts with the slitting saw which is there. We're going to use this one. This is a carbide slitting saw, this one. So it will do the job. Okay, I've just had a bit of a change of plan with regards to um, the cutter that we're going to use. So we're going to go with the slitting saw and bulk out most of it like that. But that would mean two cuts through. So I think I'm going to go with an end mill and we can get it one cut through so that will take a fair whack of it out. So we'll use the end mill. So with our old shaft set up we can position our cutter so we're taking the maximum amount of material out that we possibly can just to ease the burden on the uh, involute cutters. So we've opted to go for a carbide insert end mill um, just purely because that's my preference. Now I do have to track down a set of um, metric R8 collets one day because it is my preference to hold these cutters in an R8 collet. They seem to grip them pretty well. I mean this the ER40 grips them well but you can get the cutter closer up into the quill of the machine with the um, R8 collets even though this is a short series ER40 
This, this is actually one of the ones that I made some time ago, whereas your standard ER40 collet chucks are a bit longer. Um, here's one here. See, that's a standard uh, length one. This is one that I made also. But um, the, well, I copied the dimensions of this one off a commercial one. So um, if you watch the uh, video where I didn't make these, you'll, you'll, you'll see the reason why <laughs> I converted um, two of them to a, a short series. <laughs> anyway. Let's move on. So we've brought the cutter in pretty close. We just have a very slight gap here, about three quarters of a millimetre, 30,000 something. Now it does appear that we have a, a larger gap underneath the insert, but you have to remember when the cutter's rotating, the cutter will come around and you'll see that gap will close up right in the corner of the insert. Um, just by the tip of the tooth there. So that closes up to about 30 thou, three quarters of a millimetre. Same sort of gap as what we had on the other side. So we can swap our, we can take this part out and fit in the part we're going to machine. So now we can set a zero point on our dials for this step of the operation. This is also the perfect opportunity to test our indexing. So we'll come around. Three whole turns plus our fractional turn. We're looking good. Go again. Yep, we're right there. We'll go one more to bring us back to our starting position. And we're looking good there. Cheap insurance, that. Okay, let's get our, this part out and our new part in uh, we are gripping on the very end of it which is a well will be a bearing journal but the two uh, bearing journal areas have not been finished machined yet. They're still slightly oversized, as we'll finish machine them once we've gone through heat treatment. Snug it up. Bit of preload on our tailstock, lock off the tailstock. And lock off our indexing head as well. So yeah, the indexing head has a lock on it and it is very important that it is used. So we're gonna run our cutter on 900 RPM now, it's a fair bite for this to take out in one hit, but we'll just see how it goes. Bearing in mind too, this is like EN25 grade steel, so it's not, it ain't no mild steel or anything like that.
Right, well that's our gear roughed out. Indexing was correct. We finished off, finished off back at our start position. So now we have to swap the cutters over and we'll have a look at our setting up the uh, number two module cutter to cut the dedendum. So, and yes, it is a very unorthodox way to cut a gear, but as I've said, it is a custom profile and there are no cutters around. That's why we are cutting the root with the number two module because that fits the, the bottom half of the tooth, the dedendum. And then we're going to do two offsets with the module 2.5 to cut the top half of the addendum. And when we're on our finishing cuts doing the addendum, we can check it with our gear tooth vernier to see how we're going because there is a good unworn section on the old gear we can still get our size from. The other alternate method you could grind up a piece of high speed steel and just like in a single point, just single point it and um, put it in a tool holder. Uh, that's not a method that I was even going to contemplate because I don't know. You, you don't want to get three quarters of the way around and then have to pull the tool out, resharpen it. Um, there's a lot of other things that can happen and it. It's going to take a um, fair bit longer to do. So hence my method of roughing it out with a carbide end mill and just finish cut to profile with the two cutters. And that'll get us there. And then, yes, just a double check on final dimension with the gear tooth vernier. You should always use a gear tooth vernier when you're cutting gears if it's going somewhere reasonably critical because this will get you on size better than just touching off with your cutter and and going in so this tells you exactly where you are according to the pitch circle of the gear if i was to get another one i'd get a digital one with the digital readouts this is an old brown and sharp one and you have to use a magnifying glass to set the to or well, to read the vernier scales So now we need to get our cutter on centre. So we can do our bit to get it on centre, but have the Chinese done their bit to profile grind the tooth central to the sides of the cutter. You'd need an op optical comparator to, to check that. And if you were doing a high precision gear, well for a start you'd be using a cutter of a well-known brand and maybe have it checked on an on a optical comparator. So this is the only scary bit. We have to assume that the Chinese have ground this cutter symmetrical with the sides or the sides of the body of the cutter. So what we can do, we have a known diameter here on our shaft which is 24.98 so we can bring our, using our vernier height gauge, we can set that down on top of the shaft and we can take the reading from the top of the shaft to the table, which is 152.7 millimetres. So with that being known, we can take, then deduct half of the shaft diameter um, that comes to 140.21 and then add on 3.63 which is half of the diameter of the cutter. That comes to 143.84. So we set our vernier caliper, uh, um, our, our, sorry, our height gauge to 143.84. And then that's what we adjust then, the height of the table So it matches. So that finished height will be 143.84. That will put our cutter on centre. So we can do an approximate test on our K2 
cutter. So if I bring the indicator needle right to the corner of the tooth, I know it's going to be a couple of thou inaccurate. But it's 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 it'll get us, you know, give us a bit of a ballpark idea. So we've got it roughly zeroed out right on the tip of the tooth there. So we'll go to the same tooth on the opposite side. We'll come around and see we're getting like a ten thou discrepancy. Maybe five thou discrepancy. Okay, I'm going to call that 10 thou. So what that means is when we put this cutter in, if we put it up this side on our arbor, has the writing to the top, on our vernier height gauge measurement where we set our table height, if we add, say, 0.127 millimetres, which is 5 thou, which is half of the error in this cutter, um, we can take some of this inaccuracy out. Sometimes when you look at these cutters and you can just by your eye you can sometimes just see they're not quite like even this one I can pick it the radius on oh there's a slight difference in radius just from this corner to the opposite corner but you know for what what this gear is going to do it will be perfectly adequate so yeah, we'll just compensate 5,000, 0.127, just for the difference, the offset and the profile of the tooth being not quite centred on the body of the cutter. <laughs> Pace the check. I mean, it's not a real accurate check as we are measuring off all tapered and rounded edges, but it will give a bit of a ballpark idea. And we can do a similar sort of test in the machine. So we're sort of pretty well zeroed out on that tooth there. So if I very carefully, without bumping anything, just slacken the cutter off. Turn him over. And see, we've got 10 thou. Depends where you measure this cutter. We've got a 10 thou discrepancy right there. 10 thou, 10 thou, 10 thou. Dropping off a bit there, you know. So, just to give you a bit of a... You can sort of split the difference between assuming... The cutter is ground right and how it actually is ground so at the end of the day you're just gonna 
split the difference and, and knock a couple of foul in your favour of having your, your tooth profile on centre. So with our height gauge set on our amended height, remember we're going to add 0.127 millimetres, or 5 thou, brings us our new height to the top of the cutter of 143.96 millimetres. So we have our vernier set and we're just touching off now on the top of the cutter. My oh, vernier, I keep saying vernier. Well it's a vernier scale but it's a height gauge. Because there's no background noise here, I can rotate the cutter and I was able to just adjust the height of the table and I could hear it with my ears when it was rubbing and when it was not. And then just to confirm that, use a piece of cigarette paper and there's resistance on the paper, as there should be. And we have one other last check to do. It's more of an anti-bozo measure. If you made a mistake in your calculations, it will stick out like a, a dog's dinner. So it's just eyeballing the end of the cutter and to the centre. And like we can put our scale up here, just very lightly grab it between the two, being very careful not to damage the cutter. And that should hang freely in the vertical position, which it does. So we're pretty close. Right, let's get our um, shaft mounted. Well, we're going to mount the old shaft back up and align the tip of the cutter with the root radius. So we'll put it in the chuck and grip it very lightly so we can rotate the part and slowly bring our cutter in till it, it bottoms out and we've, we split the, you know, we even it out. Just grip very lightly so I can still turn it. Now we want to take our crank handle off the knee. We don't want to disturb our height. Double check our quill is locked. So it's just a matter of rolling the shaft and bringing the table across till we centralise. Now we are using the end, which is the good part of the shaft. It feels like we're about there. This will also set our maximum depth that we're going to cut as well. And I'd call that good, so I'm going to zero our knee dial now. So when we come to zero, that'll be our final depth. So we'll just back out of that and wind back in. See if we come in with the same result. We appear to. Okay, we'll try another tooth. So we'll go um, a couple of revolutions around. One, two, three. That's the next tooth. We won't do that one. That's the next tooth. We won't do that one. Okay, we'll try this one.
Yeah, feels like we're there. Okay. We can swap over now and put our new part in and take our first cut. Well, okay, I think we better wind this one up here. We're starting to get a bit pushed for time. We do have a fair bit more to go on the shaft, so we'll finish cutting the teeth next episode. And hopefully then we'll have time. Well, we still have to heat treat it and finish machine it. So whether we, we might even use a tool post grinder and grind them yet, we'll see how we go. So. Yeah, it's a bit of an oddball pinion to cut, so not so straightforward this one. So anyway, cheers, thanks for watching, and yeah, come back next episode.